So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depends on where you are in the world. So today we have the pleasure here to have uh, Dr. Leticia Puels from Germany to talk about testing RMS uh, challenges and solutions. And uh, also we have uh, the participation of uh, Professor Thiago Balin that will be the session chair today. But we are here today for the talk of uh, Leticia. So thank you very much, Leticia, for uh, uh, providing this uh, talk today in a very nice subject. Also, I'd like to thank Thiago Balin to be the session chair today. So I give the floor to Thiago to do the presentation of uh, Leticia. Okay, thank you, Ricardo, again for inviting me for be chair of uh, another uh, talk of this um, CAS talks. Uh, it's a pleasure to have uh, my colleague here, uh, Professor Leticia Bolzani Pous. Um, Leticia uh, graduated in computer science at the Federal University of Pelotas in 2001. Uh, in the year of 2004, she received the MSc degree in the Electrical Engineering at Pontif Pontifical Catholic University of Rio Grande do Sul. And in 2008, uh, her PhD in Computer Engineering from the Politecnico di Torino uh, in Italy. From 2010 to 2022, she was professor of uh, School of Technology of uh, Pontif uh, Pontifical Catholic University of Rio Grande do Sul in Brazil. And currently, she is a senior researcher at the Airway TH um, at uh, Aachen University, working on tests and reliability of emerging technology-based application. She is a member of the steering committee uh, for the IEEE uh, LEATS and uh, Bellas School. Uh, then, uh, mm -hmm. We'll talk about uh, testing error runs, challenges, and solutions. And before uh, giving the floor to Leticia, uh, I will um, warn the audience to um, uh, um, to note your um, and you can uh, uh, post these uh, questions in the chat in the YouTube. Uh, then, uh, after Leticia's talk, I will um, uh, read the questions and. Um, answer for you. So thank you again, Leticia. It's a, a great pleasure. Uh, when you are ready, you can start. Okay. So thank you very much for the uh, kind introduction. So good afternoon. First of all, I would like to say that it's a great pleasure to give you this talk uh, here uh, today. And as Tiago already mentioned, today I'm going to talk about the main challenges in solutions related to testing these resistive runs. So, before starting, I would like to share some information about uh, um, where I'm, I'm currently working. So, I work at the RWTH Aachen University. It's a German university that's located in the city of Aachen. So in these slides, it's possible to see a couple of pictures. Uh, the first one here on the left side is um, the main building of the university. And this, in the second one, it's possible to see the cathedral that's located in the um, city center of uh, Aachen. And the last two pictures, it's possible to see the institute where I work, that's called IDS. Um, some key facts uh, about the university. So the university has around uh, 45,000 students. Um, and the one important thing is that uh, RWTH is a German center for neuromorphic computing, which means that it's the cluster for future for this specific subject. So let's start. So we can say that uh, the technology uh, has evolved during the last four or five decades, according to Moore's law. Uh, this prediction uh, dictated how the semiconductor industry evolved. And this miniaturization uh, makes the development of high performance applications possible. Uh, however, we can say that we can see that this, uh, this miniaturization and also 
some uh, specific requirements uh, of today's uh, emerging applications poses some challenges to two aspects of the technology, to device technology and computer architectures. So basically, if you think about it from the point of view of device technology, uh, we can see, we can say that uh, some issues related it, uh, to reliability and leakage and cost. Okay, we can see that you, you have to face these issues and otherwise you cannot use anymore this uh, the current technology, the CMOS-based one. Um, from the point of view um, of computer architecture, we have uh, three main walls, the memory wall, the power wall, and the structure level parallelism wall. So basically, uh, here we are facing the problem because you have this, bottle, this von Neumann bottleneck that prevents us to use the current technology to implement uh, emerging applications. So um, in this context, what you have today, in this context, you have these amazing devices, this is no, novel devices that are able to overcome some of these issues. One of the most promising uh, devices is called the main TV device. Okay, so basically, main grid device uh, represents a promising candidate to, to complement the CMOS technology due to some specific facts related to technology from the point of view of device technology. The first one is related to the CMOS manufacturing process compatibility, which means that we can manufacture these devices on the top of a CMOS circuit a silicon-based circuit during the back end of the line. The other point that it's really interesting about this novel device is the fact that they have this zero study by, study by power consumption, solving the issue related to leakage consumption. And the, 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 the final point regarding the technology, the device technology, is the fact that they um, allow the implementation of a really high-density circuits. When you think about the architecture, what you can do with these devices, okay? We can, the fact is that we can implement not only memory elements, but you can also implement the computing elements, which means that you are going to have this uh, computation in memory, you are going to have neuromorphic architectures, which means that the first use of this device should be used across bar arrays of main restrictive devices as memory elements. But the point is that you can also use computation memory in the, the last and the most advanced uh, applications should be using these devices as an analog devices, which means that they are going to have much levels in terms of states. Okay, so um, one point Despite all these advantages, okay, we can only use these devices if you are able to guarantee their quality after manufacturing and also their reliability during lifetime. So what you can do in order to have uh, the required quality and the, the required lifetime for this kind of devices. So first of all, uh, from my perspective, you needed to understand the main reliability uh, the main sources of reliability issues, which means that if you look at this graph, it's possible to see that at time zero, which means after manufacturing, we are going to face some reliability issues related to manufacturing deviations. So basically, these deviations uh, that can occur uh, and are going to occur based on the manufacturing process, they are going to cause defects and also process variation. Okay, some uh, parts, uh, some some process variation. Of course, it, it's uh, um, it can be observed also in the CMOS technology, and you are going to have like two types of process variations: the tolerated ones, which means that you are going to translate this variability in a kind of corner, and we are going to have a kind of performance degradation. But you can use the device. And the other one is a process variation that's considered uh, extreme, which means that when you have this, uh, this behavior, this deviation, you are going to observe some faults as the same uh, when you have some kind of defects. So um, 
from the point of view of lifetime, what you observe is that these devices, as occurred in the CMOS technology, they are also going to be susceptible to time-dependent deviations, which means that you are going to observe some kind of environmental or operational variations that are going to cause some transient faults, okay? And also you are going to observe some temporal variations that can uh, are going to, um, to, at the end of the lifetime, to become like a stuck at faults, but they are related to degradation during the lifetime of the device, which means aging of the device. Okay, so these are the two um, main um, uh, points that you need to understand before trying to develop some uh, novel application um, with the required quality and the required reliability. But today we are going to talk uh, about uh, the main challenges related to time zero, which means how to deal with reliability at time zero after manufacturing. So basically, if you wanted to address this issue, you needed to be able to develop efficient manufacturing test strategies. But what is that? Okay, we needed to be able to uh, properly test these devices at time zero. But the problem is that for doing that, for develop, developing uh, uh, more suitable uh, manufacturing test strategies, we needed to um, have accurate fault models and uh, that are derived from uh, the analysis of the possible defects that really can occur during the manufacturing process of this device. So basically, observing this graph on the right side, it's possible to see that there is a relation between, at physical level, a relation between the defects that can occur during the manufacturing process and, sorry, and the uh, fault that can uh, uh, appear when you are uh, uh, checking your design. So basically, we are going that uh, we are going to have some different kind of defects. And for each defect, you can have you can propagate a different kind of fault behavior. So for these novel devices, we need to understand if, for example, the fault models that you use for testing CMOS technology, they are enough. And we are going to see today that they are not enough. You need to have different ones. Okay. So this is the outline of uh, my talk today. So um, we are going to start uh, defining uh, what is a main resistive device. So main resistive device. So what is that? This is a novel device. It's one of the novel devices that appears in the domain beyond the CMOS. Okay, we have other uh, different novel devices. This is one of them. And it was um, uh, postulated uh, by Yong Shua in, uh, at, in, uh, 17, in 1971. And um, basically, uh, what is that? Is defined as a passive element that can be described by the time integral of the current through the time integral of the voltage across its two terminals. So here it's possible to see, for example, the, um, the symbol that you can use for representing the device, okay? And what you can do with this main restive device? Basically, a main restive device can, or a main restore, uh, can have at least two distinct states, which means that these devices, depending on the voltage that you are going to apply, can assume a high resistance state or a low resistance state. Okay, and we can switch this device applying a specific voltage. So in that case, you are going to have a specific voltage for performing this set, which means the transition between high resistance state and low resistance state, and the reset operation that it is the transition between the low resistance state and high resistance state. And also you are going to have a specific voltage that's going to be applied for reading the device, reading the contact of the device. That has to be really slow, really low in order to uh, avoid a switch between the states. So in this context of main resistive devices, there are different kinds of the main resistive devices. 
that are going to be classified depending, for example, uh, of the switching mode, of the conductance mechanism, the switching mechanism. And uh, depending on the, the material that you are going to use, you are going to have a different one. So uh, basically, uh, initially, we can classify as ionic thin field and molecular main restore or magnetic and spin based main restores. Okay, in this talk, we are going when I say main, a main restive device, I'm talking about the first type ionic thin field and molecular main restore. And uh, when you use this kind of device for implementing memories, we are going to talk about the resistive random access memories that our memories classify as non-volatile memories. So specifically in this, uh, in this work, uh, here we use a bipolar main restive device uh, that is based on the conduction me mechanism called the co uh, conductive filament, which means that you need to form this filament in order to provide the switch between the two states. Okay, and it's a VCM device. Okay, so these are the devices that we are using today at Hagen. And uh, we have a couple of projects where we intended to use it and develop it, this kind of device. So um, before presenting the resistive run fault models, I would like to present a couple of definitions just to uh, be sure that you are on the same page. Okay. Uh, first of all, the first important definition is the defect definition, which means that what is a defect? The defect is a physical deviation that uh, occurs due to the process that you are using, which means that it's a physical imperfection, okay, that may lead to a fault. Sometimes you have a really small defects. You know that from the CMOS technology, for example, for FinFET as well, that sometimes these really small defects, they are not able to propagate any fault behavior. Okay, but sometimes they are. So what is a fault? A fault is a representation of a defect at the abstract function level. Okay, and when you have this fault, sometimes you can have like faults that are not going to be propagated. Okay, but when they are propagated at the system level or the application level, we are going to have a error. Okay, so basically, is that the the basic definition? So uh, recently, in this paper here that's listed here as a reference, uh, the the authors introduced the a specific definition for a fault um, when you are considering a main restive device. Okay, so basically, they defined a fault as any deviation from the main restore's expected behavior due to process variation, manufacturing defects, or design-induced anomalies. They also introduced a concept that it was already used in a certain way for the FinFET technology, for example, that's a fault size, which means that is the, uh, the depending on the size of uh, that fault, the impact can be catastrophic or can be just parametric, which means that the fault is not going to cause any functional misbehavior. The fault is going to change something in the performance of the, 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 the circuit. And the last one are the faults that the, the magnitude is insignificant and consequently the fault is, is called as benign. To conclude this part related to definitions, okay, the last point that I would like to mention is that, okay, I, I said that we needed to be able to develop um, efficient test procedures for these specific novel devices. And for doing that, you need to have more accurate fault models that are derived from realistic defects. But when what you need, what all, all, we also need, we needed to have these defect injection schemes. We needed to understand how to inject, how to model a defect that is uh, properly representing the defect that you have at the physical level. So basically, in literature, you can find two types of defect injection schemes. The first one is the resistive defect, is the classic one that's adopted for CMOS technology usually 
differently. That's basically on the introduction of uh, resistors. And depending on the, the size of the resistor, you can have a different, you can propagate a different fault behaviors. And the other one is the defect oriented model that's basically uh, is, is based on an idea or modify some electrical parameters of the device of the technology library of the device in order to um to to have to observe some kind of fault behavior okay so let's talk about uh, these resistive runs fault models so a couple uh two years ago basically we um did a work where we published this paper in the journal of electronic testing where the idea was to try to understand a little bit more what can happen during the manufacturing process of this uh, novel device these main risk de devices and try to identify the main um manufacturing failure mechanisms that can cause some kind of misbehavior Okay, so we started this study trying to compare the manufacturing process of the CMOS technology with the manufacturing process of these main resource. So um, if you think about the manufacturing process of CMOS technology, we know that this process um, requires many processes that are, we are going to repeat this process uh, several times until we have uh, uh, the circuit complete. And um, um, this process is usually divided in two main parts. That's the front end of the line and the back end of the line. Okay. And when you think about CMOS manufacturing process, you are going to start with the wafer preparation, followed by photolithography, etching, doping, material deposition, planarization, and all these classic steps. Okay. One point that's important to note here is that <clears throat> Yeah. Uh, one specific process, one specific step, for example, doping, can be performed in different ways using different kind of equipment. Okay, and this may can impact on the failure mechanism that can uh, occur uh, during the manufacturing process. So, what you did here, the idea was to analyze the manufacturing process of this of this specific kind of main resistive device. And this device, it's a, a, a resistive run cell, okay, that aims to create devices composed of bottom electrode, transition metal oxide, and top electrode. So this is the schematic view of the main resistive device, and this is some pictures of how the device looks after manufacturing. So we divided the manufacturing process of this uh, structure, these main resistive devices. So basically, here it's possible to see the 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 the, the silicon, the the, uh, the the substrate, and then you are going to have this bottom electrode deposition, and then you are going to have a patterning and etching, and then you are going to to uh, to do the deposition of TMO. Um, then here you have this capping layer and the topping electrode, and then you are going to patterning and do etching. This is the basic process of uh, manufacturing this kind of main resistive device. Note that depending on the, the, the place that is manufacturing uh, main resistive devices, they can assume different kind of process and they can have different steps, for example. Okay, But for this device that you are doing here at the Aachen, this is the step-by-step uh, -step process. So what you did, for each step, we tried to um, uh, identify the possible process that you can use, like, for example, for a bottom electrode deposition, you can use a, like a, phys a physical vapor deposition. You can have this nano imprint lithography for patterning and so on. And one point that I would like to highlight this is that after the manufacturing process of these main devices, this specific novel device it requires one more step that's called a forming process, which means that you need it to, when you manufacture the, the, these devices, the uh, resistance state will be really high. So you need to perform a first set operation in order to form this conducted filament. And this process can also influence the behavior of the device. Okay, so this is something that's being studied um, uh, here as well. So um, what you did for each 
um, for each step, we identify the possible defects. For example, when you are doing the bottom electrode deposition, you can have problems in the thickness um, of the, the material. Uh, we can have a poor or no bolding with the contacts. And depending on these possible defects, we can we are able to identify the possible uh, defective or fault uh, misbehaviors. Okay, so you did that. And after this analysis of the entire process, we are able to uh, identify five main misbehaviors. So the first one is the increased or decreased resistance of contact and lines. We can have a lower rate of conductancy. You can have a lower quality or ineffective forming step. That's the last step after the manufacturing process. We can have increased uh, bottom electrode oxide interface oxygen vacancy concentration that is going to affect, for example, the way the, the switching activity of the device. We can have a changes in oxygen vacancy concentration in the oxide. So these are the main. Uh, the, these uh, are the. Uh, five uh, main risk behaviors that we are able to identify depending on the uh, failure mechanisms that can occur during manufacturing process. So um, basically, when you look at, for example, for one of the misbehaviors, we know that this ineffective forming step is going to influence the switching activity. Okay, and this specific um, misbehavior can um, cause some easy to detect faults, which means that we are going to have static faults. You are going to have um, like uh, stuck at faults. The de device will be stuck at, at a specific uh, state. Or you can have also the possibility that these devices may switch from high resistance state uh, to a undefined state. Okay, so this is when we um, realize that the, the faults that can be caused by the defects that are going to be introduced during the manufacturing process can present some kind of unique behaviors. Okay, so this uh, corroborates the idea that you need to develop a new um, ma manufacturing test strategies. So, in general terms, we can classify the fault behaviors of the resistive run cells in three main um, categories. So basically, the first one, the cell is not able to correctly switch it during the set and the reset, impacting the device's functionality. So when you are going to observe that, this is a easy to detect fault. It's this classic same behavior of, uh, that you observe in the CMOS technology. Okay. And the other two are a little bit different. Basically, you can have a parametric deviations impacting only on the cell's performance, okay? Which means that you, you are not going to observe any fault behavior propagated at the logic level, but you have a kind of parametric deviations, which mean that you have a higher current consumption or you are going to observe a voltage, a resistance state that's not the nominal one that you set. So it's a parametric deviation. And that in this deviation is going to impact the performance of the device. And the other one that's really different and it's really difficult to detect is these random misbehaviors. We can have in these devices what you call, for example, you have two kinds of process variations here. You are going to have device-to-device -device variability, uh, and you are going to have a cycle-to-cycle -cycle variability. We can have random misbehaviors that in a certain moment, you are going to perform some operations and the device, the cell is working properly, but sometimes the cell is not working as expected. The, 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 the fault is completely, um, uh, it's completely random. Okay, so this is really hard to detect and you need to understand when you are going to have that. Okay, so this, you need some kind of strategies that they are able to combine, for example, the idea of measuring something, of doing parametric testing with logic testing. Okay, so we are going to talk a little bit more about that in the next slides. So regarding the fault models that you have today, 
and that you use it for developing, for guiding the, uh, the development of manufacturing test strategies. We have this resistively run conventional fault model that includes all um, fault models, all faults that you also observe in the CMOS technology when you think about the memory, for example. And we have this unique fault model. In this, in this unique fault model, here you can see the representation of the states that it can, can be assumed by, the, this, by a cell, for example. So here you have the low resistance state, the high resistance state, and sometimes you can have a fault where the state is classified as undefined state. You are, you are the, the, the cell is assuming a, a, a resistance state that is in between the two um, nominal ones. Okay, so in that way, you are going to have an undefined right fault. You can also have some kind of extreme or deep fault. You can have a, a extremely high or extremely low. And you can have this uh, random behavior where you are going to have this unknown read default. You don't know what's going to happen uh, because it's a problem when you read the device. Okay, so here it's possible to see in this interval this unique faults, and also these conventional faults are going to happen at this level, at the nominal one. So we are going to have a fault that's propagated at the logic level, and for this unique faults, you are not going to be able to see that. So um, to complement this work, this analysis, this work is that you uh, published in this paper a couple of years ago, we, at the moment, we are performing a deep analysis of the um, uh, manufactured uh, main resistive devices. So, which means that the idea is to perform a, fa a manufacturing failure uh, uh, mechanism analysis and also a process variation analysis. The idea, we develop here a CMOS-based circuit for a deep characterization of manufacturing uh, main resistive devices. So this circuit is composed by a couple of functional blocks. And uh, we have the ability, for example, have a specific circuits for the forming phase. You have a on-ship pulse generator. You have a current compliance because it, the, the set operation requires a current compliance in order to avoid that the device is going to, um, to, to that a, a higher current is going to flow to the device. So you have a couple of functional blocks that are going to help us to properly characterize the manufactured main resistive devices. So the idea is for each die, we can manufacture one single main resistor and you are going to have like a single 1T1R resistive run cells, which means uh, one transistor and one main resistor and you are going to have a memory cell. So this is a work that uh, we already started since the last year, and now we are going to start to collect the first uh, data. So let's talk a little bit about testing. Okay, so from now up to now, what I said that we um, already uh, know that we have a different kind of faults and that you need different uh, strategies in order to assure the quality required after manufacturing. So let's talk a little bit about testing uh, uh, and some definitions and types. So when you think about testing, so what is testing? So basically testing, uh, the idea of testing is uh, shown in this uh, uh, schematic, in this picture. So basically you are going to have a circuit under test. You are going to provide some input stimuli. We are going to observe the output. You are going to compare with something, the expected behavior or the golden reference. And then you are going to classify a good circuit or a false circuit. When I'm talking about here about testing, um, I'm talking about manufacturing or production testing. We can have different kind of tests, as 
I think that you already know. You can have this characterization that's usually performed when you are designing something or when you wanted to explore a little bit more, more something. It's so you need to understand what can happen, what is the expected behavior, and so on. You are going to have the manufacturing testing that's going to be performed in all dyes that are manufactured. All chips has to be tested. So which means that you have some constraints in terms of time of testing and so on. You can have a burning and income ins inspection between uh, before integrating something. OK, so but today I am going to talk about manufacturing testing for these uh, novel devices. OK, so here you need to test all chips that are uh, manufactured uh, in order to assure their quality. So when you also think about testing, you can have, as I already mentioned, you can have a parametric testing or you can also have a functional testing. OK, when you have a parametric testing, you are going to measure some Think you are going to check the electrical uh, the electrical parameters of the chip of the cells of the circuit in order to identify if you have some kind of deviation, and the functional it's fault model oriented, and uh, the idea is to apply some stimuli or some vector and check if the answer is the one that you are expecting. Okay, so. Um, specifically for these um, novel uh, memories, these uh, resistive runs, okay, um, I believe that the first use of these uh, resistive runs um, will be take the chips and use these uh, uh, resistive runs as memory elements, okay. So here we are. We needed to understand what you have in terms of. Uh, manufacturing test strategy for memories. And you needed to understand if you have for the CMOS technology is enough for testing this novel memory elements. So when you think about manufacturing test of memories, uh, we can um, classify the strategies in three main types. You can have a hardware-based strategies, you can have a software-based strategies, or you can have some kind of hybrid approach that combining both, okay? The classic way to test memories, okay, is a software-based strategies where you are going to use March test that consists of a sequence of March elements. And what is a March element? It's a sequence of writing, reading some all cells that are in your memory. Depending on the sequence that you are you are going to apply, you are able to propagate different of the faults at the logic level. So you can observe like a incorrect uh, or incorrect read fault you can observe like a read destructive fault and so on but all these faults requires that the fault behavior is propagated at logic level okay but the point here is that for these novel devices you have these unique faults and you are not going to observe any fault behavior propagated logic level which means that in a certain way you need to combine a functional test with parametric testing okay so in the last um, years, a couple of uh, strategies have been proposed. And uh, here, it's, for example, this one point that you already know is that March tests um, cannot guarantee the detection of all unique faults. So um, you needed to find a different way to test these novel devices. So one um, a couple of years ago, a skin based the sneak path sensing was proposed to test this crossbar arrays. The point is that this strategy was proposed for testing what you call as passive crossbar array, which means that as a cell is composed of only one main restore. Okay, and today we know that the cells. Uh, in order to have a more stable cell, we are going to have a 1T1R cell, which means that you are going to have a cell composed for, of one transistor and one main resistor. Okay. Uh, we also have this uh, work where two DFT sch schemes that they explore the access time duration and supply, supply voltage level uh, for facilitating the detection of unique faults were proposed. And... Um, uh, basically, uh, it's able uh, to provide a high fault detection capability, but it uh, requires, uh, as a drawback, you can identify the test time. Okay. 
So in the last uh, years, these two other um, approaches have been proposed. Uh, the first one, again, is for a passive crossbar array, array and the second one is uh, a computation in memory-based DFT that uh, um, explored uh, that uh, um, the idea is to uh, provide detection and diagnosis of faults and explore the idea of the reconfigurable logic designs. Okay, so this is another uh, approach that was proposed uh, last year. So, but today I'm going to present some strategies that we are developing here at Aachen in the context of a project that you have here. Um, so, as I mentioned, the main challenge here is first you needed to understand if the fault models are enough or are properly representing the fault behavior that you can have. And the second point is that you, we already know that in these novel devices, you are going to observe some unique faults. And these unique faults are going to change something parametrically, okay? So the idea here was uh, two years ago, we proposed a strategy, a design for testability strategy that combines the execution of predefined operating sequence with electrical measurements. So basically the idea is a hybrid approach where we are introducing a specific sensor or circuitry that's going to perform some kind of measurement while we are um, applying some specific uh, sequence of a reading and write. Okay, so here it's possible to see the electric, electric schematic view of the sensor. Here we have a one cell. So in this first work, it was just validated the idea. So the idea was to, sh uh, was to um, show if the sensor, the added circuit is able to properly um, identify this deviation, this parametric deviation. So um, we implemented this, uh, this circuit that use a set of uh, reference resistors. So you are going to have a reference for the high resistance state, a reference for low resistance state, for extreme and uh, so on. Okay, so based on these references, you are going to compare uh, what you are measuring uh, during the execution of a predefined sequence. And in that way, we can indicate if you have a fault or not, okay? So for validating the idea, we uh, uh, designed, we developed a case study composed of a 1T1R uh, residue v cell implemented using this uh, technology library from XFAP, okay? And we injected the defects using this um, resistive defect model, which means we model the possible defects in, in, in injecting some resistors. So um, in this graph, basis, basically the idea is to show um, that uh, the proposed strategy is not only able to detect these uh, traditional faults. So here we have the detection of stuck at zero and stuck at one. So uh, here it's possible to see that the, 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 uh, the sensor, the circuit was able to indicate the fault behavior. And also that uh, this strategy was able to um, detect these unique faults. So here we have the situation where you injected a defect of 15 kilo ohms. And uh, we can see that we have a different behavior, a different uh, uh, undefined um, a right, a right fault. So the cell, instead of going to high resistance state or low resistance state, is going to remain in this uh, a, a, with a value in between these two uh, nominal values. Okay, so here again, the sensor was able to detect that. And this deep fault where you needed to compare and uh, uh, with this... Uh, uh, references and uh, the sensor was also able to do that. So this first work is was a validation of the idea. We extended this work in a chapter 
And uh, in, in, at that moment, we provided a discussion about uh, um, area overhead. So the idea is that to use these sensors or the circuit, um, um, to connect the circuit not uh, to each single cell, because otherwise you are going to have a really high overhead. But we can explore the idea of these structures um, in a row-based or column-based granularity. And in that way, we can decrease the impact of area overhead. OK, so here it's also possible to see the layout. So we performed some measurements and um, in order to evaluate uh, the idea. OK, a couple of months ago, we optimized this idea, but now we implemented the, the, the sensor uh, considering a, a case study that now represents a, a memory block. So now you have a, an array of uh, uh, resistive run cells and um, we connected uh, each sensor to each column. And in that way, we are also able to observe that um, this strategy is, is able to detect these unique faults. Okay. Um, in this graph is just to show that you are going to have a, like an interval where uh, the, the, the sensor is going to indicate when you have a fault behavior, when you have this undefined condition. That's this uh, yellow curve here, OK? But uh, we have some problems with this approach, OK? It was able to detect, but uh, uh, as it's possible to see here in the, the schematic view of the, the, the block view, the, the block diagram of the, we have this uh, amplifier here. And uh, the area overhead was um, relatively high. And the point is that this amplifier is really susceptible to process variation, which means that in that in this case, um, uh, this process variation is going to affect the, um, the, the resolution of the sensor, which means that you can have some kind of false positives or false, false negatives. So um, in the last uh, year, we worked in a, a new ver, uh, optimized version that will be presented in two weeks in the Latin America Test Symposium, where we tried to uh, modify and to eliminate this sense amplifier, this uh, amplifier, and uh, to use the sense amplifier, to reuse the sense amplifier of the memory in order to reduce uh, process variation impact and also area overhead. Okay. So um, let's conclude uh, my talk today. So what you, uh, I can say, I can say that you need new manufacturing test strategies uh, because the, the, the strategies already proposed in use the four CMOS based circuits are not enough. They are not able to detect these unique fault behaviors. Um, in that sense, we needed to understand that uh, we needed to provide some hybrid approaches. You needed to combine um, um, logic propagation with parametric testing. Okay, we needed to do that. And um, today, if you think about the testing of these devices, if you are going to add some extra hardware, if you are going to add some circuit, um, why not trying to use the circuit also for online testing, for example? So this is an idea that we are currently working on, um, where we intended to use these blocks not only for manufacturing tests, but also for online. Because the reliability of these devices, assuming that you have a, a, the, the required quality after manufacturing, Another big challenge is related to the reliability of these devices, related to the endurance of these devices. And you are going to face really um, big issues when you are uh, trying to use these devices for replacing, for example, flash memories. OK, so uh, basically you need to find a way to understand when the device is aged. OK, and in that way, we can try to explore again these structures to perform some kind of online testing, okay? 
So uh, to finally, I would like to thank you to all uh, colleagues that uh, currently uh, collaborate with me. So I have a lot of uh, nice collaborations at Aachen University, also at the Fortune Centro Julichi, um, that they are the, the guys that they are able to manufacture this device for us with TU Delft and recently with NXP in Hamburg. Okay, so thank you very much. And uh, I'm open for questions. Okay, thank you, Leticia, for this very interesting talk. Uh, let's start from um, questions from the audience. If you have, we can type the questions in the chat, so I will read uh, the questions for Leticia. Uh, we have a question here uh, from G. I'm just learning the top of main restore. May I know how how can you detect the error for the undefined state at time zero? And what can you do to overcome this problem? Okay. So um, basically, okay, at time zero, which means after manufacturing, okay, you have to test these devices. We are going to have this undefined state. Uh, as I, I show in my uh, presentation, we have, I think that I can go back and I can do that. So um, in this diagram, it's possible to see that we are going to have, um, a, the cell is going to assume a resistive state that uh, has a value in between the nominal ones, okay? In that case, if you are considering a memory, um, the, all the peripherals that you have around your crossbar array, uh, they may are going to indicate that your memory is um, properly working, okay? Because you can have sometimes um, a state in this undefined range, but depending on the logic that you have and the secret that you have for reading, you are going to categorize it as a zero, as a one. But the point is, is that this is a parametric fault. This is a parametric deviation because the resistive state is not in the nominal one. And the point is that when you have that, you need to be able to identify because this will be a cell with a lower endurance. Okay, because the, uh, the, the logic for reading these memories is like you are going to set a threshold and then you are going to have a kind of uh, reading uncertainty. Okay, and when you have this, these cells in this undefined state, they are closer to this reading uncertainty. And at a certain point, they are going to be stuck. At. Okay, so the point is that uh, this justifies the um, the fact that we needed to add some kind of parametric testing that's the only way to do that we needed to measure the state of the cell and then you are going to understand if you have a resistive state that's located in this range oh, i hope that i, I answer your question okay thank you very much leticia do we have more questions from the audience okay um I, uh, I have a question. Um, I was wondering when uh, you were presenting the, uh, the, the built-in sensors that you have developed to, to the, the DFT strategy that you, you are proposing. Um, I was just wondering that um, the, the memories as run memories, uh, uh, let's say CMOS and FinFETs and so on, they need some kind of uh, analog circuit to make the, the, the read of the memory, that's the sense amplifier. And then that circuit that you show it uh, is, is, is indeed a, an analog circuit. Mm -hmm. And then uh, um, I was on wondering if, if the memory, if uh, uh, built with um, resistive uh, main, res main resistors, um, they will need a kind of uh, sense amplifier uh, and a ride. Yeah, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and how this uh, amplifiers, um, let, let's say, that um, to test a, 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 a error run memory, we need to test also the sense amplifiers, correct? 
Mm -hmm. And how different are these sense amplifiers from the amplifiers that are used in CMOS memory uh, uh, and FinFET memories? And how are the, the challenges to testing this kind of circuitry that are needed to perform the read of the memory, not only the, me the memory cell, um, itself? Okay, so basically when you have, okay, you have a couple of founders today that you are able to manufacture these devices. We currently, uh, we are uh, have access to the, this TSMC uh, that's manufactured with 28, 28 nanometer technology. So basically the peripherals are going to be in manufacturing using CMOS technology. They are pretty similar. Okay, we are going to have like a threshold for reading writing. The point is that you have here, um, you have a different uh, thresholds for this device. You are going to have this um, right threshold, which means that we are going to have this curve and you need it to assume a value higher than the threshold for high resistance state, for example, uh, in order to be able to store, for example, this zero, okay? And then you are going to have the same, the opposite for the low resistance state, and you are going to have a different threshold for reading because you, when you are reading the device, you can assume some weak values in the middle. Okay, but the point is that when you are writing, you are always going to try to put the memory in the um, highest uh, high resistance state that you can, but not uh, arriving in these extreme values. Okay, so the of course uh, the circuit is pretty pretty similar. You have also to guarantee that the, the, the resolution of the sense amplifier and so on. And the point here is that for this uh, new optimization that we are going to present in Latin America the Symposium, we did this job. You, we reused the sense amplifier of the memory for doing these comparisons in order to avoid the introduction of the amplifier. Okay, so in that way, you are reusing that, but you are adding some new references to test, to evaluate exactly that. So you have these ranges and not just one threshold for writing and one threshold for reading, basically is that. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have another question from G. Could you explain more on how you use sneak path sensors to detect the fault? Okay, this is sneak path is more for um, passive crosses, uh, cross, uh, crossbars. Okay, uh, what uh, uh, the one that you are proposing is for uh, what you call active one T one R cell. When you have a passive crossbar, hey, usually you just propagate this this um, the sneak path. Okay, the, the consumption, and then you can test. Okay, so the concept is different. The memory is different. Okay, so you cannot. Uh, I don't think that you you can use for a passive crossbar array this strategy that at the end there is uh, no sensor to use it because you have a, a simplest way to do mm -hmm. um, you showed in, in your presentation that the the um, number of manufacturer uh, steps of i mean resistors uh, is uh, less than uh, the, the steps that we have for CMOS technology, for example. Uh, can you can we expect uh, um, uh, a small probability of faults because we have less steps, or what can you say about that? Yeah, I I, I don't think so. Of course, uh, here we have this um, research center that is located at Yulihi that collaborates with the university. And they, of course, they don't have this high volume production because they are um, doing some experiments. They are trying different things with different materials. Okay, but today we were able to establish like a process. We modified the the masks in order to introduce some inspection points. And, um, but the, the point is that the, we are going to have like uh, problems in the bonding, problems related to the thickness. Um, maybe the same uh, manufacturing uh, failure mechanisms that you have in the CMOS. But the point is that due to the nature of the device, 
in the way that you have to form this conductor filamentia after the first forming, and then depending on the voltage you are going to form or you are going to, to provoke a, a rupture of the filament, and then you are going to have different resistive states. Due to the nature of the device, default behaviors are different. Okay, so I don't think that you are going to have a, the probability of having ma uh, manufacturing defects is, 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 is smaller. I don't, I don't think that. that okay, I think that it's not low, lower than for CMOS. And um, of course, it, if you have a stable process, you are going to have defects, but also process variation. That's another point that uh, these devices are also susceptible to process variation. Today, we are trying to perform some kind of analysis to try to have some kind of corners for this technology. Okay, because you can have and you can assume different corners. Another point that's um, uh, I believe that's going to happen with these devices, we are going to have a different kind um, of, um, uh, uh, let's say, we are going to have a different kind of uh, manufacturing test strategies depending on the um, the target application of your device, which means that you are going to have a like application oriented manufacturing testing. You, you don't need it to submit, you don't need it to show that your device is able to work at really high temperatures or have a, uh, or to prove a really high endurance, depending on the application, for example. So in order to increase the yield of the memory, we can assume uh, different um, setups and you can have a more application-oriented manufacturing testing. Okay, depends what they call as, uh, a, for for example, a temperature mission they call, and then depending on that, you are going to testing a different way, and the requirements are going to be different. Okay, yeah. I think that this will be something that's going to happen uh, for different kind of applications for using this novel device. Okay, so thank you, Leticia. Um, so we don't have more questions from the audience, okay. then um, I would like to thank you again for this very interesting and nice talk. Um, I will remember the audience that um, uh, you can uh, subscribe to, the, to, to this channel to receive the, the notifications. And then, um, uh, Leticia, if, I don't know if you want to, to make a, 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 some last considerations, if you have some something to, to say about the opportunities of uh, working with you in Ehen, so you, mm -hmm. you feel free to, to do this before we, we finish this session, so you have okay. some something mm -hmm. to, to say about that? Yeah, so um, thank you again for the invitation. So uh, yeah, this is, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Aachen is the uh, cluster for future in this subject in Germany. So we have um, several activities. We have uh, several, uh, we have people working from the device level for circuit level, from people from material engineering and so on. So we have uh, several opportunities. And in the field of testing reliability is something that there are a couple of groups in the entire world that are doing that. So um, if you are interested on this subject, uh, I would be happy to, to receive applications. And we also have uh, some open positions in the group. So feel free to contact me. OK, thank you so much again. OK, thank you again, Leticia. So let's finish this transmission. Bye bye to everyone. Mm -hmm.